All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, we appreciate your flexibility during this time um, and appreciate that you are able to join digitally um, and, and honor uh, social distancing. So we appreciate your time. We appreciate your flexibility. Um, and we want to make sure that we um, are still able to provide you um, the hard work of our model sites today. So we're going to get started. Um, as we do, I wanted to just uh, point your direction to our website, Project Success Indiana. And once you are there, uh, the resource tab really has about everything you'll need. So you're going to find um, all of our resources, but most importantly, you're going to find a regional training drop down. So when you find that regional training drop down, go on ahead and select the model site 2020 um, folder. And there you will have our presentation, a link to Padlet where we're storing information for a long term. Um, upload videos um, very shortly to that website to um, just show you uh, the work that our model site has done. Those are um, independent interviews with each of our model sites. So just another resource that you'll find. Um, and then last but not least, uh, you will find the flyers for our professional development, which is coming up for 2021. Um, so we will begin um, right now. Um, and then I will take time to show you each one of those things as we as we progress um, with this webinar. So again, thank you. Uh, this is our model site agenda, and we're really going to be focusing on what it what are the goals of each model site and then um, allowing our model sites to really take the floor in a panel session and share the information. So because we have so many wonderful speakers today, we will be um, sharing a mic. So we're going to ask our speakers to introduce themselves as they're answering those questions. Um, and then uh, if you're having trouble hearing, Ashley is monitoring the chat box. We'll interact that way as well. Um, but uh, please be patient. We're doing We'll do everything that we can to make sure that you're able to hear um, and get the information today. So just an overview, we're going to highlight our model sites um, and uh, please go on ahead and utilize that chat box that that is being monitored today. And we want to hear your voice and some of the great things happening. Uh, one thing that um, we are going to do is uh, we're going to just take a moment to introduce uh, each one of our project success team members. Um, all of us are here today in the room. You'll hear Heidi and I's voices often, but you'll see Ashley Quick, one of our project success coaches in the chat box. And then our project managers are here as well. Um, you probably received lots of emails from them, Mary Baker Budisa and Christine Krieger, um, who support uh, the scheduling of all of our um, on sites and model sites. So um, team is here. Amy is also digitally there and able to join the chat box. So please ask questions, utilize that chat box. We um, have a process to um, utilize the chat box questions in our panel session. So please use what you have and, and thank you for being flexible. So we're going to use our first time with the chat box. So if you would please um, go ahead, introduce your name, school district and grade levels or specifically the roles that you're working on. Um, and give a second for everyone uh, both here um, and those that are joining digitally to hear and meet you and where you're from. Uh, we have had representation from across the state uh, earlier today with our primary session, and I know that we'll do the same uh, this afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. So we have individuals from BCSC, we have team members um, from Greenfield that are going to be speaking today. Uh, we have our Crown Point team, our Seymour teams here, um, our Noblesville team, fantastic, our Purdue um, University group, um, Eastern Butler Eastern Green, welcome. Kokomo team, fantastic. Um, please continue to introduce yourself there. Um, because I think it's so neat to share those ideas from across the state. Um, and you'll hear the same as we're, we're working with our panelists today. Um, we're going to go on ahead, continue to introduce yourself as I continue to speak um, and, and share where you are from. I just wanted to introduce you to Project Success. I know many of you might be um, 
understanding our work, but I wanted to share it a little bit more. Um, Project Success supports districts across the state of Indiana. Um, we support, support higher um, academic outcomes and making sure that students with significant cognitive disabilities have opportunities for communication, academic instruction aligned to grade level standards, um, and then focusing on those employability skills. Um, you'll see on this slide a variety of the ways that we reach districts. So um, whether we're on site and at your district um, and you're working with a project success coach, if you're working intensely through our uh, model sites, um, our webinars, we have quarterly webinars that we host including open office hours, which I think is a wonderful way again like today to connect with teachers across the state. Um, and then last but not least, we support all of these um, content um, across all of those opportunities, whether it's a webinar or on-site professional development, focusing on formative assessment, all the way to unpacking um, and curriculum mapping. Today, we will highlight um, specifically within our panel, the unpacking process as well as inclusive practices, but that, that is not limited to the questions that you may ask. If if um, you have other questions, please ask them on the chat box. If it, it, if it cannot be answered by our panel, our project success team will find those answers for you. Um, so thank you um, for using that. Our model site summit, the purpose of that, of this time, is to highlight the work of our nine model sites. Um, and to be honest and transparent about the challenges and the successes of our teams, um, making sure that we're really highlighting what our best practice uh, were, um, how we utilize administrators to help support that process, how teachers are working collaboratively with SLPs and paraprofessionals, um, and how all of us have to work together to achieve those goals. Um, and really then last but not least is to answer any questions that you may have, um, knowing that you're experiencing the same challenges and the same successes at your own building. So please feel free to utilize that chat box as I mentioned earlier to do so since we aren't able to be together. Um, so now, if you could, um, in the chat box, go on ahead and talk to us a little bit about what you're hoping to learn today um, and how we can continue to make this um, time together, although not um, in person, but digital, great. Um, so while you do that, I'm gonna pull up the website um, just to show you where everything is today, um, and we'll go from there. Please be answering that. All right, so while you're looking and answering those questions, this takeaway of what you're hoping to learn, I just wanted to show you projectsuccessindiana.com's website um, and, and walk you through those resources. Uh, you will see on the resource page, you will have um, all of the resources that we use in our professional development. And then today, under the res regional trainings, we have a 2020 Model Site Summit um, drop down. So, Feel free to open that up. On this page, you will have everything from our presentation to uh, we're gonna ask you to fill out an aha moment. Um, at the end, you will be able to utilize up the planning template. We wanted to share that with you, what our model sites use to plan their goals for an entire year, month to month, long-term and short-term goals. And then you're gonna see all of, and we will talk to this more, all of our professional development for 2020, 2020. 21. Um, so you will have access to those and we'll walk you through that. So again, you're going to find that underneath the resource tab here at the top and then underneath the regional training drop down. Uh, feel free to look over all of our resources um, and we'll highlight many of them today. We also have a Padlet set up. Um, you will see that link throughout the um, presentation today that is set up to house everything from the flyers to um, different resources on our website. It also has uh, many of our model sites weren't able to be able to show what they brought today. So we have uploaded many of those and we will continue to add to that if if our model sites have more to share. So just wanted you to have access to that. Um, I would utilize the chat box for your questions today just to make it easier on Ashley, but there is a question uh, portion of that too. So if you just use your chat box for that, that would be the most helpful. 
All right, so without any further ado, um, we are going to introduce each of our model sites and we're going to start with New Pal. Um, this is New Pal, New Pal High School, second year, and they are joining digitally today. Um, so they will be uh, jumping in the chat box and we'll do our best to get them unmuted um, at specific times during the panel session. But New Pell High School, uh, Kara Westerman is the teacher there. Um, it is her second year as a model site um, team. Her focus this year has really been inclusive practices, really thinking about how do we provide opportunities for students um, at that high school level to have access to biology, English language arts, um, making sure that those facts classes are accessible for students. So um, her focus this year was collaborating with her general educators, um, making sure that every, every teacher that she works with one-to-one -one had professional development, making sure they understood that the content connectors are aligned to the Indiana academic standards, and just ideas for modifications in the process. Um, so again, Kara and her team will be joining digitally. Um, our Greenfield Junior High team, this is their second year as a model site, um, really had two main focuses this year, uh, really big goals. So one was to spend time curriculum mapping in both English language arts and math, um, specifically taking those critical or high priority content connectors, um, determining what those are and math aligning them um, in a scope and sequence that made the most sense to build upon skills um, and make sure that we uh, covered each one of those high priority content connectors. Um, and then in e English language arts, aligning that within the general education curriculum, looking at that first, determining where those gaps were, and then making sure that um, those gaps were identified and, and supplemented with additional resources. Um, one of the other things that this team really focused on and Hannah and Nick are here from as general educator, science teacher, and social studies teacher. They're going to highlight um, how those collaborative experiences were. They aligned curriculum and access for all students uh, within those two classes today. Our next team is our Tippecanoe Valley High School team. This is their first year as a model site um, and really began very ambitiously looking at biology, um, making sure that. Um, John Hutton, the teacher, uh, general educator, the biology teacher, and Jenna Burton, the, the special educator, worked um, just relentlessly one-to-one -one looking at that curriculum map, looking at the high priority content connectors every Thursday, making sure that they're meeting together um, and that Jenna is able to join those biology team um, meetings so that um, there's an understanding of what's coming up in the, in the week, what, what those curriculums what the curriculum looked like, what the activities were, and then how those needed to be modified or adjust, adjusted. So um, they'll both be on the panel today to talk through that process as well. Our next model site is our Cookville High School uh, model site. They've been with us um, for two years as a model site. Our first year we started out with one classroom, one teacher, um, working on um, really just thinking about unpacking and what like to curriculum map and what, is, what it could look like as a program um, for a student. Very much self-contained self and um, we're not um, kind of many, uh, going throughout the high school or switching classes. And so we kind of looked at the first year. Now in our second year, we have, uh, the model site is now all four teachers and students are, um, instructed by all four teachers in the program, and we're really looking at um, curriculum mapping, unpacking all those st the standards within um, the curriculum maps and lesson planning. And then also we took on um, really looking what it was gonna be for inclusive practices in their, in their school. And so we started um, really implementing some of those practices and really are um, continuing to plan for that so that we can increase that for next school year. We have uh, the principal, the vice principal, and two of our teachers here today on the panel that you'll be hearing from later. And then our Manchester Junior Senior High School team. Um, Manchester is unique in that they um, have both a primary model site and a junior senior um, model site. So um, it allows for that uh, vertical alignment across grade level. Uh, 
um, it's within the same district. Uh, they've also been receiving professional development from uh, Ashley Quick um, on our team for three years, um, just within their cooperative. So Wabash Miami um, area program, um, just allowing for them to begin with a great foundation to uh, the um, content connectors, best practice, presumed competence, and then expanding on what that looks like in Manchester schools, both primary and secondary. So we will hear from our teachers today, um, and they have experience for three years as a model site. And then last but not least, we have our Fort Wayne um, community, or Fort Wayne community schools, and we have Memorial Park Middle School that will be joining the panel. And uh, Deb Cook is the teacher there teaching and focusing on mathematics. It's her second year as a model site. Um, she has spent tremendous amounts of time looking at um, her program and having to make some make some changes about um, what was being taught in those classrooms, going from IP goals um, to making it about those high priority or critical content connectors um, and really making it very engaging for students. Um, if you get a second uh, to look at the videos that we'll upload, there's a, an excellent lesson on slope and you'll see how um, the visuals, uh, the engagement of students all align back to those critical content connectors, just highlighting um, just that, that strong instruction. All right, so what we're going to do here, um, we're gonna pull our panel forward and we're gonna switch the view um, and we're gonna start our panel questions. So as our panelists are getting ready, we are going to um, go on ahead and have their names up here um, so that you know who will be there. Um, and we'll take about two minutes. We'll pause ourselves here and allow them to move forward and then we'll begin the process. So if you need to stand up and get a drink or stretch at home, please do so. And then we'll go on ahead and get started in about two minutes with those questions. Yeah. Are we are we broadcasting as camera? We had enough All right, we're about one minute away to get started. Um, our panels, as you can hear, is getting getting situated. So we're going to get started with the panel questions in just a minute. This is a really important time to um, use the chat box to ask questions. We'll pause at the end of the unpacking section to open it up for questions. So um, we'll get started here in about one minute. I don't want to be on it. See? Oh, lots of got it. And I just use hand sanitizer. So this is nice. All right, so we're having a little trouble with the uh, WebEx and those questions there. So we're going to open up the questions. I'll hold the mic and pass it to you. Um, 
So what we're going to talk about first is unpacking. And then after we do a session and some questions about unpacking, we're going to move to inclusive practices. Um, our panelists will speak when they have an answer to it, or if they don't want to, they will not. Um, but we are going to pass the mic. So those of you who are joining digitally, it may take just a second until the answer uh, until that panelist receives the microphone. So we'll work off of that. But we're starting with unpacking and we're starting with where did you begin with unpacking? Um, and we're starting with what is the grade level, the subject, the course? What does that look like in your district? So unpacking, what does it look like? Hi, my name is John Hutton. I'm from Tippecanoe Valley High School. Uh, this, the last two years at my school, I teach uh, ninth grade biology with Jenna. She's my co-teacher. Um, we have been curriculum mapping and we're kind of finishing that process for our biology class. So what we started with uh, is our first year as an inclusion site was looking at our power standards, looking at what we had already kind of set up as our prime vocabulary, our prime activities. And we went and started to pick those things apart. Um, I think in, as, the year, as the year has progressed, we have realized that we have a lot of work to do to be much better at that. I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things as you get into them that you discover the kids are better at and that they need, and other things that they need more modification. To. So, you know, really it was the idea that we kind of had a structure in place, we're able to compare it to the content connectors and then develop from there. Um, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of success, uh, and boy, it was just such a great thing to have that, that structure already. Uh, but that that was the way we kind of progressed was looking at what we had and and then matching things up and then developing the, the or modifying the the activities as we went through. Hi, I'm Erica Vogel from Manchester Junior Senior High School. The way I looked at curriculum mapping, I'm a special education teacher and I have uh, students anywhere from seventh grade all the way up to um, age 22 and um, of all ability levels. So I have some students that um, were much lower functioning and some that were, you know, just under the, the ability to um, pursue a diploma. And so I started by mapping out and unpacking the high school standards. Um, and my uh, partner this year was a math and health teacher. And so um, I started with math standards um, as my focus and are continuing to work on that. I'm Anna Finley from Greenfield Central Junior High. And I started a few years ago, but um, my director at the time just asked us to take one content connector, one subject area at a time, because it looks so overwhelming to us. Um, so I started with math just because math was easier for me um, and started with something I already knew how to do because some of them, I mean, not that we didn't know some of the eighth grade standards, but some of the things we just don't use every day that I don't realize that I'm using. So I um, had to relearn, I think, a lot before I could teach other people. but. I just started with math and then built from there. This question kind of came up naturally, but as you were, those of you who answered, um, as you were thinking through the process, um, who did you include in this? I know some of you reached out to instructional coaches. There's your SLPs. Who did you include um, in your process of unpacking? What supports did you need and who provided that support in the process? Um, I, like I said, at first it was just what I knew and then kind of broke it down from there. Honestly, at the very beginning, I started using YouTube <laughs> and I would go back through that. But as I've kind of gone through things, I realized how important it is to have a math teacher, a general ed math teacher kind of break that stuff down with you or my science teacher, or my geography teacher, like they know the content. And as Mr. Yule likes to say, likes to say, he's the keeper of the content, but they, they are so valuable because they know so much about it. Whereas special educators, we have to know like, really just how to modify that and break that down and help the kids connect to it. Um, so I think what I've learned is using my instructional coaches and using my gen ed 
um, teachers, partners, um, to help do that. So that's where I came from. We uh, sat down as a group during our meeting times. We had uh, Stacy Revere, who's our curriculum coach, or sorry, our content coaches, come in and meet with us. But we also had our other biology teachers in there. Megan Wilkes here, our special needs director, was a part of that. And we sat down and looked at, uh, Megan was really good about bringing things in from the content, and Jenna from the content connector side. And then myself and the other biology teacher kind of uh, tried to align things. And that was a great fit for us to have another person that was kind of outside of, of engaging with the kids to say, hey, this, this might be a way to do it, and then uh, kind of modify from there. Okay, and then I uh, consulted with, our, like, over the last three years as a cooperative, um, our teachers have all um, worked on trying to start the unpacking process, and so we've kind of bounced ideas off of each other. Uh, for that, and then um, I talked with my SLP um, people at Patents to help spur some ideas for some kiddos, um, our curriculum director, my gen ed teachers, and then just other team members that we have in our buildings. Hi, I'm Kelly Barker, Vice Principal at Kokomo High School, and with the um, training for unpacking standards and curriculum mapping, um, we really started with some summer for professional development and then building those relationships with our gen ed teachers, because um, it was just as much out of the comfort zone for our transition teachers to reach out, but for them to also open up and kind of modify and change their expectations for a different population they were used to having. So we have kids kind of going out one at a time and looking at that process. Um, so how we have some of those opportunities available to them as well. Um, it's still a work in progress, but we continue um, then to also, like you had explained, to really include more of our OT and PT and look at what can we be doing while they're with us in the special ed classroom so that they're more prepared when they leave to go out into the gen ed classroom, so. As, as every person was talking, a couple of piece, pieces really stood out to me. Um, the value of having your instructional coaches included, the value of having your, your administrators being a part of that and supportive, um, and, and then the value of uh, as special educators, we're masters at modifications and we're masters at behavioral supports. Um, and then our gen ed teachers uh, are the masters of the subject content. And so having that partnership is so essential. And I think that came, came alive in each one of your responses. Um, thinking about knowing communication, we work with many students that um, ha use, utilize alternate forms of communication. At times, we're still trying to identify the best form of communication for our students. And knowing that communication really is the foundation to access to academics. Can you guys speak to um, how you uh, brought communication, alternative, alternative forms of communication to your students and found the best match for your students, whether it's AAC or Braille or sign language? How did you guys work through that process? We're still working through that process, <laughs> um, really depending on, of course, with the IEP and case conference decides, but um, our teachers have started a communication lab where the speech therapist is coming in and there's really a team of people that are um, looking at, is their current form of communication most effective? Do we feel like we're getting adequate responses from the students that are um, in comparison to what you think they're capable of doing? And then um, they've started some different processes um, of communication for our nonverbal kids in the special ed classroom. So we're going through right now, if this is really helpful, how can we transfer that to the gen ed setting? So we're kind of in experimental phase to make sure that what we're doing transfers in whatever setting they're in. Yeah, yeah, and scales down as well, yes. I guess one of the things um, both Sarah at the elementary level and I do are we make sure that we include core vocabulary um, in our instruction and make sure we point out those those important pieces and then have, I feel like I'm shoving it in my face, sorry. <laughs> and then um, 
have communication boards for students so that they can um, point to uh, pictures to respond if that's appropriate for the student. Um, you know, and maybe that's not the way that they communicate all of the time with pictures, but maybe to get responses from questions, that's how they best respond. And so that's how um, we use our core vocabulary um, boards and things to help uh, spur some of that um, academic for them. So the next thing that I, I want us to talk about, and, and we know that it takes a team and there's an approach as we're unpacking, but how we leverage and utilize paraprofessionals and related service providers through the process. I know many of you, um, you might be in an inclusive setting or you might be providing um, that direct support for a student, but at times you're, you're um, collaboratively with your para to switch and, and be in those classrooms as well um, or providing those supports. Um, so talk about how you model for your paraprofessionals, um, how you make sure that you're on the same page as it relates to the content that you're unpacking and teaching academically. Hi, I'm Jenna Burton from Tippecanoe Valley High School. Um, I have a paraprofessional in a world history class, which is a freshman class. Um, I kind of just threw her in it and said, here you go. Um, I'm focusing on biology this year. She's done great. She's actually worked with two different teachers. We have had one move down here to this area for a relocation for her husband. But um, it seems to be going really well. She does the modifications kind of when they need it, and she'll just uh, work with, ask me, I guess, when, um, you know, hey, how should I modify this or do they need it modified what do they do so it's just been kind of a communication based thing this year and i've kind of let her take it and run and she's really done really well so hi angie love Grove kokomo high school um my para too takes things and runs with it she does a lot of the um content instruction, why I do a lot of the one-on-one -on -one with students to make sure that they're understanding what's going on and maybe sometimes dealing with behavioral issues. So my parent does a lot of the modifications and instruction on her own and she is a superstar. She, she does a great, great job. All right, so as we're thinking about un um, we're providing access for all students um, and we're making sure that every level of student has access to that high priority content connector. So I, I want you to, to talk slightly about what the impact is on students, what the impact is, um, and give me specific students examples without breaking confidentiality about the impact on student learning. What are you seeing as you raise your expectations, as you align to academic instruction in um, grade level content connectors, modified to their level, um, what does that look like? How has it come alive for students? What's the student impact? Uh, Nikki Rinker with Kokomo High School. I have worked with my students on biology and life science this year, and I had a student during an IEP her, her mom was really actually excited because we had been doing a section on heredity and genetics and we focus a lot on uh, core vocabulary and I try to take that vocabulary and and make it fun when I'm giving it to the student so that it's not just uh, throwing facts at them or reading a paper uh, I do a lot of uh, videos to show uh, things in a, in a way that they can connect with. And I'm not afraid to get silly with my kids. And so the parent was really excited and shared with me that during this, this lesson every day when we would review the vocabulary before we'd go on, her daughter would come home and tell her that uh, we're learning about genes today and not the kind you wear. And so it was just really kind of funny uh, to watch her stand up and do the whole thing Thing that I showed her every day and so her mom was really excited that she was bringing that home and learning it and and applying it to her life. Uh, 
Um, I had students that uh, went to preparing for college and careers um, this year for the first time, and I had parents that were pretty adamant the first couple of days of the semester that said, I don't think they should be in that class, and I think you're crazy for this. Why are you wasting everybody's time? And I said, please just trust me and let's give it a try. Um, and within like a week or two, the parents were calling me and they're like, why is my kid bringing home college pamphlets? And I said, well, they're here visiting during lunch. Why can't they go get one? And they're like, oh, okay. And then a couple of weeks later, they're like, they're actually talking about this college and things that this college has and questions they asked him. And I said, yeah, went and investigated themselves. I didn't force them to go talk to them during lunch. You know, like, so little things like that, even though it might be a little bit out of their reach, the kids were investigating just because they heard it from somebody else besides me telling them. So that was pretty exciting. And the parents were like, oh, maybe you weren't so crazy for putting them in that class. <laughs> Um, we have like so many awesome examples. I oh, sorry, thank you. I'm not holding it high. We have lots um, of great examples, but I will share this one where um, w one of the boys went home and we were reading the graphic novel, The Giver, in class. Um, the rest of the gen ed curriculum was reading the regular The Giver. We just got the graphic novel. And one of my kiddos was like so excited and he was going home telling his dad and they went to the library and his dad said it was the first time he's ever asked to go find a book. Like normally he would just go pick out movies. And he said he got the book and he started reading it to him and started telling him all about it and telling him who like characters were. And his dad was like, I know it's uh, fall break, but I have to tell you what is happening at my house right now. And he was like so grateful that he had the access. And I will, I am not kidding. We read it first nine weeks and my kids still carry the graphic novel around with them to classes and stuff because it's just what the other kids have and they're super excited. The parents are excited and um, it's just a, a simpler version of what everyone else is doing and they're excited. So that's just one example of many. I just want to share um, with some of this evolution, I feel like we have finally turned the corner at Kokomo High School where kids, to parents aren't asking anymore, um, why, why are you raising the expectation or my students aren't used to this or why do you have such high expectations to them being very thankful and almost anticipating the next lesson or unit. Um, because they see their students are learning. And as an administrator, um, I was doing an observation in Ms. Lovegrove's class, and I was listening to the students talk about what was happening next door in Mrs. Rinker's in science class. So, and she teaches history. So when they were talking about and relating those lessons, you could tell the kids are really absorbing and internalizing the higher expectation of standards that we're teaching. And that was incredibly rewarding. So Kara Westerman from NewPal is on the line. Um, she was is joining digitally today. So we're going to unmute her and allow her to have. The, um, she's going to share just a student example. Hi, this is Kara Westerman from NewPal High School. Um, I just wanted to share our student growth and that we have seen. Um, my example is in our English class. We go out to an English nine class. And currently the students are reading um, Romeo and Juliet. So while our students are in class, I have them listen to the Shakespeare version of Romeo and Juliet. And then I pull them out to my class um, every once in a while. And we bought a um, book called No Fear Shakespeare. So I, it has kind of a modern English version. So I'll go ahead and I'll read that version to them as well. Today we just took, um, we read act three and I had complete class notes that I modified. Um, Ashley cre or Abby creates a um, class notes where the students fill in the blank. So I've modified it where I have the students, I give them two choices to fill in that blank and we had a student get 100% on it. Um, I think Shakespeare is, you know, dif difficult for a typical kid to understand. So the fact that our kids are 
um, are reading this and comprehending what they've read, I think is a huge um, success story that we've seen. So I wanted to share that and how proud we have seen each of our students grow with our classes and having them out in those regular ed um, classes. Do you want me to answer the parent question as well? With um, the pair pro uh, question that had been asked, I had just wanted to say that my um, pair professionals um, are, they go out to classes. Um, I'm not always to get out into all the classes. In a perfect world, I would love to be in every single class and modify all the work. Um, I obviously cannot handle everything. So I do have my students go out or my pair pros go out and they do modify in the classroom. Um, they help those students through that work. Um, they modify it as needed in the room with the students and they work together with them. Um, my paraprofessionals are really good. They know my students. I've, I've been lucky that I've been with them for a long time. So I think that helps with that modification piece. And then I work with them in, um, as well as help train with them or train them in being able to you know, take that work and what we need it to do, break, break it down for them um, so that they can modify in those rooms. Um, and I think they also do a really good job at communicating with the teachers and myself so that all of us work as a team and we're all working together to kind of get that work modified to meet their needs. Perfect. Thank you, Kara, for jumping in and, and just chat with Ashley when you want to speak. And thank you. Um, thank you to our panel for pausing for a minute. So um, and allowing. Um, so one question that came in through the chat box is thinking about biology, how the unpacking process went. Um, where did you start? It's, it's a more difficult subject for students with significant cognitive disabilities. How have you made that work um, through collaboration between gen ed and special education? Uh, I would say that we this year probably didn't uh err on the side of the connectors to begin with as much as we should have and we're we're veering that way much more strongly now uh, but I think that it's about removing I don't want to I don't I guess I call them steps so for instance in this last unit it was graphing the energy that chlorophyll you know absorbs and the, the wavelengths and so for everybody else they had to figure out their intervals and they had to do all these things and set their graph but for the inclusion kids they had their graph already set they had their intervals they just had to put their data in and then it's providing them with a chart to make the connection easier uh, along, along the bottom. It's just ways like that where you you shorten the pace between the connections you need them to make. And in shortening those things and, and taking this other step out, they're able to be six more successful. We found they're able to be more successful um, connecting those ideas and being successful and, and having, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, grasping what's going on and, and and referring back to it but i think it takes time to realize how you're going to do what you need to do for these kids and these kids and, and mold those together uh because sometimes they're not perfect they're not perfectly aligned and so um, you have to do a little extra sometimes or a little on the side and i know that's something we've talked about actually talked about today again about that will be our summer goal is really revisiting that and <laughs> excuse me developing a better uh, a better pathway through that When mapping out my biology course this year, I relied heavily on the gen ed biology curriculum maps and aligned those with the um, four connectors um, and made sure that those were the ones where I absolutely focused on. Uh, we focus a lot on uh, vocabulary and then, um, like you said, build up a lot of extra supports that uh, some of the gen ed kids don't get. And so, and we do a lot of projects. Uh, it really gives them a sense of ownership in the class. We do a lot of group projects, um, mixed level groups, and we'll the pair with each group. And then the kids get all the support they need to, to get those concepts. And we've got a lot of really excited learners in class, um, but, Focusing in, in on those core content connectors with those curriculum maps has been essential. Um, some questions here. So this question is, what does collaboration look like um, with multiple grade levels? So I know many of you have 
multiple grade levels or, or through 22 um, or all of junior high. So um, if you could talk to what does collaboration look like with multiple grade levels in subject levels um, as we think about unpacking aligning standards, curriculum, and instruction, and really where you started with it. At Kokomo High School, we really started with a conversation of do we first look at ability level or grade level, right? Because we have English 9, 10, 11, those units that the students have to have. So um, each year we look at the group of students and then we plan. Um, we have gone by grade level, but we make changes as, necess or as necessary, like if class sizes are too large um, or where can the student have the exposure that we're looking for. Um, and then we look at a lot of different grouping in the classes, whether it's gen ed or special ed, so that um, the student's ability level can be met while they're still getting exposure to the grade level standards. Deb Cook, Memorial Park Middle School. Um, I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and so um, I cover the content connectors for all three grades. And so I looked at where should they start in sixth grade, where should we end in eighth grade, what does that encompass, and then try to work from there um, because I have all three grades at one time. So when we start a unit, we start with the sixth grade and we work through those and then progress up till we get to the eighth grade standards. And we'll switch. So our collaboration has kind of been um, looking at what all of that encompasses and how we, some things overlap, some things we need to stretch further, um, and then break down the content connectors after that. And at Manchester, I picked like one teacher to start collaborating with at a time and we started from there and jumped off the deep end and grabbed a hold and everybody just ran with it. Because we're a small school, um, a lot of the classes that students are enrolled in are the same teacher, just different courses. And so once a teacher kind of got to know the student and the needs of the student, uh, the next course they're like, I'll just touch base with you. And so there wasn't as much like, back and forth and intentional meeting, um, but more of, okay, I kind of know the needs of the kid now. Can I just touch base with you? Um, and since we've been kind of doing this for three years with different students, you know, some kids, it requires more collaboration time and more unpacking time with those students' needs in mind. And others, it was, hey, I got it, no problem, let's roll <laughs> and I'll, catch you when there's a fire and and we'll run together and figure it out. So um, that's kind of how we've done it. Um, I'm at Manchester as well. I'm a PE math and health teacher. Right now I have eighth grade or seventh graders through 10th graders. So lots of variety, but communication between uh, me and the special ed is so important and um, also getting positive feedback because when you're a general teacher, a lot of times you're like, well, I tried this. I don't think it really worked. But then she would come up and tell me like, hey, this worked awesome for that. And I'm like, okay, I'm doing okay. So um, for the SE to just say, yeah, you're, you're on the right track. That's really good for the general educator. Um, and also not for the general educator, not to be scared to just ask, hey, I need assistance here. Um, I think that was the biggest thing to help me feel more comfortable when I had students who I'd never had in the class before. So. Um, well, I can just share a little bit. Okay. Um, I can share a little bit at the junior high. We have grade seven and eight. And at first I started out where I had kids in seventh grade science and seventh grade um, in eighth grade science, and it was too much for me to try to balance and send my IA and they're on different pages. So we just decided when we go out to gen ed that we're going to do seventh grade one year and then the next year we'll do eighth grade. So last year we did history in eighth grade and then this year we're doing geography and then next year we'll go back to history. So the kids will get those subject areas and they'll get everything. It'll just happen. Um, might be on an opposite year, if that makes sense. Now, when I teach math in ELA, it's self-contained. So what I've done, and I'll sit down with you, we went through and paired up 
content connectors, but like she said back here, like some of them overlap. So, you know, you might be addressing something, but you can address the standard at the same time. So we basically just laid all those critical content connectors out for some kind of thing for both math and ELA. Um, and ELA is a little bit easier because you can use whatever story you're using. And, The resources that was really helpful with, at Greenfield Central is we use the vertical alignment document. I know multiple um, districts have done that, but on, on the Project Success website, there's a vertical alignment document. It aligns the standards side by side, so you can see how they progress between grade levels. So I think that's a helpful resource. Um, we're going to go over to just the questions from the chat box for just a minute. Um, we have a variety of uh, sizes of schools here, and one of the questions was how can a larger district implement some of some of these um, concepts in, uh, of unpacking within their district uh, where things are a little bit more spread out. So can I send that to you guys, Kokomo? Um, just to address that. Okay, um, so we are, I'm sorry. Okay, um, we're really fortunate, I think, and don't, we have a lot of resources um, where we have four transition teachers, and so they have split the content areas, um, so we know the core content is taught and self-contained, unless our students are um, cognitively higher functioning or can experience anything academic behaviorally benefit from being out in a genetic classroom. So those are all pretty individualized conversations. We have built some relationships with what we've just included as champion teachers, which are some of you genetic teachers here today. Um, so we have some kids that go out for classes, but we have um, like Ms. Lovegrove teaches history plus a few and Mrs. Rinker has science. Then we have an English and math teacher as well. And then we are really intentional about them, the students, that can go out to um, get their elective. And so we like for all of them to go out. At some point. We're working on planning for our wheelchair bound. Looking at what is it that we want them to experience and then what part of the day able to experience. Those are part of the conversations where the parents become very helpful instead of giving us embracing what the plan looks like today. Um, one of one of the other questions is we know that this takes an entire team and we know that it starts at the top from administrators supporting teachers and supporting paraprofessionals. So can um, teachers as well, could you guys talk to how and what those levels of admin supports were um, from your leaders and, and how that helped with the process? And leaders, um, how you support your teachers? We've had a lot of professional development at Kokomo High School um, from our administrators, and I, I know that anytime I've reached out for any kind of assistance for our administrators, they've been there, um, whether it's an email or a phone call or a visit to the classroom, um, because it, it does take a team to, to, to work with our students and to get them um, the education they deserve. So we get a, and then Heidi, comes in and provides a lot of professional development with us. Uh, there's webinars and it really just a lot of support just to help us through this process. My name is Megan Wilkes. And I'm a special education director at Tippecanoe Valley Schools. And um, I think we, we just have a really good admin team at our high school. Also, our principal is very supportive of inclusion. We started a lot of things outside of just classroom inclusion this year. We have a unified council. We have unified sports that we do at our buildings. Excuse me. And so the natural next thing was to support our students with um, more intensive needs in the classroom and give them the opportunity to, you know, experience general education curriculum. And so when this model site opportunity came about, I just thought it'd be perfect. Our special ed teacher, this is her first year in that role. So what a great support Meredith's been in our school. And then just finding those teachers like John that have just been willing to embrace the opportunity, you know, to support students 
our students that you know are earning a diploma are, are always included in those classes now and and I think this can just even enhance those teachers and, and get them more excited too but now giving other students opportunities excuse me that are earning a certificate of completion to be in the classrooms as well and it can't really happen unless you have supportive administration and they have that same um, passion and same just feeling about inclusion so that's I think the Bikini Valley High School is is very fortunate that they have that uh, supporting them and the teachers. The administration at Greenfield has been super supportive um, from the beginning. We've had Project Success come in and do some training, um, and then when we became a model site, they've given us time to meet with them and meet with coaches, and we've set up a thing with a neighboring school, New Palestine Schools, and so I get to work with a junior high teacher there, um, and kind of we talk and brainstorm. It's been amazing to be able to have time for that. So um, we also have PLC time that I know our administrators have built in at least once a month. I get to go with the subject area of social studies and science. So I, I feel like what we need, if we ask for it, they'll give it to us. and. Um, I know my direct boss has been there because we've had some behavior concerns lately, and so she's been there supporting us and being in the classroom and just kind of being a cheerleader to help us get through that because it's been kind of a challenge. But um, yeah, so they've been super supportive, and I think it's really, I, I think listening to your teachers and what they're saying because we're the ones that are there every day walking it, right? So, so yes. I'm Nick Ewell, Greenfield Central as well. Um, one thing we do at our school that would be beneficial to others who don't do this, I'm sure they let the teachers do this all the time, but is to go visit the other classrooms. And that's how I initially got into it in the first place was to see it in action. And when we, you can do that, you can go in and see how well it works when you have the help of your uh, help teachers in there and it just makes you feel more comfortable so if you can if you are an administrator and you don't let you I'm sure they let their teachers go and visit other classrooms whenever they want but yeah maybe usher them to go to those type of classes where they can see it in action and it definitely helps in my opinion that's how I got in so. and I would just echo at Manchester um, they've supported us to uh, work with Project Success for multiple years and have supported any of the additional time and training that we've needed to make any programming changes or collaboration with our gen ed staff as well. Um, we kind of started in the classroom and then this year added uh, unified sports. So um, like we went <laughs> A little opposite of how Tit Valley did it, but in partnership with some of the um, teachers and administrators at Tit Valley, you know, giving us support and ideas and, and thoughts for um, how we could get some of these things happening at Manchester. Also, um, you know, just collaborating and, and starting one step at a time, just adding one thing here. Fort Wayne Community Schools, I feel, has been so supportive of us and um, the curriculum department and our special ed department has been totally on board with the content connectors and they have set time aside for us. Last summer, um, we were all together and writing curriculum and trying to come up with lessons that would support those content connectors. And again, this summer, we're going to get together, write some more um, curriculum focusing on math and language arts. So uh, each month we have a night set aside where we can meet and talk about curriculum and go over um, scope and sequence and content connectors and different lessons, questions that teachers have. We have that time together where we can all bounce ideas off of each other. Um, as far as my building, um, our administrative staff has just been wonderful. They are so supportive. And what do you need? How can we help? Um, don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to step out there and try something. It's okay if it doesn't work. So I truly appreciate that. Um, that's that's been a, a change, and uh, you know, definitely for the positive. Um, you know, I said, well, I'd like to do this, but I don't have the technology, and they made it happen. You know, I would like to do this, but I'm not sure how to get this. And next thing I know, I have somebody at my door, you know, hey, how can we help do this? How can we support you? So um, they have been totally on board. And I think the switch in the administration also is now they're looking for ways to include us. Um, so they're like, hey, we have this coming up in two weeks. 
how do you think that fits into your program? Can you be plugged into that? What do we need to do to change it? Um, so that's been a, a very good mindset change within our school. Um, I was just going to say I'm brand new to the transition program. Um, so it really has been a lot of learning for me this year, but the support has been of this world. If I want to try something, I'll go to Kelly and sky's the limit. I mean, try it. If it works, great. If not, we can figure out how to make it better work. Um, and just the support that I feel from administration is great because a lot of times programs, special ed programs don't get that. Sure, do it, try it, whatever you want to do. Um, and, and Kelly gives it to us. We. I think if we have high expectations of our kids, she wants to support that and, and make them successful. So I really appreciate that. Um, this, this is a question from the, the chat box. Um, as, as a panel, what do you feel um, or how could you su suggest for another teacher who feels less supported or less understood by their administrators? Um, I know that this has been a progress for all of us. So thinking back to maybe those early years, um, what and how did you advocate for yourself? Um, and how did you share those successes so that everyone understood uh, those high expectations and presuming competence and in academic instruction? So I would start with, um, there were several changes in upper level administration before we started this and so i really was trying knew this would be like a one shot kind of thing like once you sell it like they're, they're gonna buy it they're not and you just can't go wrong when you're talking about what kids deserve and so when talking about i felt like really educating them i was putting together my pitch for why i had already volunteered us to be a model school and then i knew i was gonna have to really ask <laughs> and make sure that was okay with central office and so when they were educated about why, it's really hard to argue because it's good for kids. So if you're meeting resistance, I would just continue to educate, educate, educate. I mean, you can always go to Article 7, but I would try the nice, really nice way of just educating why it's good for kids. For me, it's been important to stress the positive. And, um, you hear people say, well, we can't do this and we don't have that and that's not possible and I don't know why we're doing that. That kind of helps everyone to shut you out. And when you say, wow, can you believe that we're learning about and you say what that content connector is and they're like, really? You're doing that in your class? And um, I had a gen ed teacher say, you know, I come by your classroom every morning before on my way to my classroom just so I can see what your learning goal is for today because I can't believe that's what's going on in your classroom. Um, and I think it's important as educators that we um, take every opportunity when you're in a meeting and or you're sitting even in a staff meeting and you have informal small groups, point out that positive. And um, when everybody's complaining and they're, they're not very happy with what's going on and you're sitting there saying all these positive things that makes them take note and then they want to be a part of that. I'll just direct everyone back to the Project Success website. So um, if you um, are starting at the foundational piece, um, utilizing the, the idea of presumed competence has come up in several conversations here today. Um, we have several resources about that in a webinar. Um, those are, watch that and get some takeaways to have those conversations um, because that's built on research um, and, and it, you can't, to Kelly's statement, you can't deny what's best for kids. Um, so I think that's a really important piece as well. Um, thinking, hindsight is 2020. So thinking about unpacking, um, what would you want to, would have wanted to know ahead of time. So now we're here, we've started the process, many of you have unpacked um, a, a new teacher, someone new to unpacking, what do you wish you would have? I'm trying to do it in all of these areas it's really hard so no, reflecting back if i just would have like gone to the gen ed math teacher and said hey or even to 
my administrator and said, hey, can I sit down with the math teacher? Like, give us a half day to sit and break it all down for the math coach. Um, I would have done that. So that's where, starting out, that's where I would go. Everyone dittoed that. Everyone uh, dittoed that. So for those on webinar, everyone agreed with that, starting with Jen Ed. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to your instructional um, instructional coaches as well. Um, have them come in and model. I know Ina, um, who just answered that question, she brought in the ELA instructional coach to model finding context clues um, and finding some of these, you know, higher order thinking. Um, our gen ed teachers are the experts in the content. We can go in and provide the modifications. So don't hesitate to reach out and, and ask for support. It's come up in several uh, several different conversations here today. Um, last question on this, and then we'll move to inclusive practices. So uh, really, what are your next steps in the unpacking process? Goals for next school year? Things you want to do differently or the same? We were actually brainstorming on the way down here um, with a new staff and experienced staff. Um, we didn't start with those champion gen ed teachers. And so we were doing a lot of brainstorming about how do we, even though we teach a self-contained version of every subject that they will need, it will be on a rotation. It's not all at one time. There are still some students that need to go out into the gen ed setting that are capable and look really having a map of how do we prepare the student? How do we prepare the gen ed teacher so that we're not setting either one of them up for success? Hopefully include a much higher number of students in the gen ed setting. Yeah, just to piggyback what Kelly said, I think um, sometimes for us and for our kids and for gen ed teachers, it's a scary thing um, having, having different types of students in your room or having to try to figure out how to um, best communicate your curriculum, um, I think it can be a scary thing. So I, I pointed out that I think it's important for me to build a relationship with that gen ed teacher first. So then they can trust me and my expertise. And then if I trust that teacher, more than likely my kid is going to trust I do. So I think it's all about building positive relationships and again, just making it best for for each individual kid. Carol Westerman from New Pal um, to take the floor. And so we're going to open up the line so that she can share out kind of her takeaways here. Um, my kind of my goals for next school year is that um, I really want to push the um, finish or finish my curriculum mapping and then work with um, the English department. That's been the main curriculum map that I focused on this school year. I, my hope is to have both the English and math completed. Um, but for this school year, I'm hoping to finish with my um, English and align it with the content or the uh, regular ed curriculum map. They're also working on theirs right now. Uh, so once theirs is finalized, my plan is to try to meet with them, um, kind of make sure that my curriculum map lines up with their curriculum map, and then also even to see if next year I can kind of meet with them in some of their meetings and um, go over what are the content connector standards, how they're lining up with what they're teaching, and how that's going to help us um, work together as a team next year. Um, the other thing uh, my goal is for next year is also to start kind of planning out um, I'm actually meeting with Meredith soon, and we're going to go through and schedule out, you know, each grade level, what classes I want my kids in for, um, for science, for English, for math, and get that planned out. So I have a four-year plan and know exactly where my kids are going to go freshman year, where they're going to go sophomore year. And then another thing I'd like to sit down is talk about that 18 to 22 group. Um, you know, once they go through those four years of high school, what are we going to do with that group um, and, and start formulating and creating a plan for them. So it's kind of where I have my, uh, where I'd like to see things going. Thank you, Kara. Um, so now we are going to, um, thank you for sharing, and we are going to jump into inclusive practice questions. Well, um, trying to do one and not the other. Um, so what we'll do is many of the questions kind of came up naturally, but we're going to just open the questions now for our panelists around inclusive practices. So, um, and I, I've seen several questions even coming through the chat box about 
that. So um, inclusive practices, collaboration with gen ed, collaboration with your entire team, admin all the way through um, paraprofessionals and making sure that um, everyone's voices are heard. So talk to me a little bit about where you started in the process for inclusive practices. What did that look like in the beginning? Kokomo High School um, is broken into different academies. So we made sure that each academy had a representation of our um, students with IEPs and could get support no matter what academy they were part of. Um, and I'll let one of the teachers talk about the academies that they belong to and some of the practices that they. So uh, I am a science teacher at the Kokomo High School and we're part of the STEM Academy. Um, we do a lot of inclusive work. Uh, last year, uh, my students uh, when I taught social studies decided that um, way to battle social hunger and food insecurities was to start a greenhouse. So um, I contacted our um, and said, can I get a grant? And so I got a grant. We started a greenhouse. Um, but I reached out to our agricultural uh, teacher in the career center and uh, he let us go out and use the greenhouse that's attached to the school. So we started stuff in the greenhouse and then uh, he's got a garden at another school. So we went and looked at that garden to see what it looks like and how it works. Um, I, I recently reached out to one of our other science teachers because uh, now we're studying biomes and one of the biomes we're studying is obviously the deciduous forest where we live. Well, our school is fortunate enough to have a little uh, pond and forested area with a lot of natural wildlife. And so I've reached out to that teacher and um, asked him, hey, can one of your classes take my class out to see that? Can they show my kids, uh, show our kids uh, what's out there? Um, and so, yes, we're working on setting that up. So his entire class is going to come down and escort our kids out there. Um, we have greenhouses in our class. Uh, the kids, uh, we also have a coffee cart or a coffee corner. And so now we have a lot of gen ed kids coming down and we've got a lot of projects going on in our classroom and, and our students absolutely adore showing the kids around to our tadpoles that are now frogs and showing them our greenhouse and the things that they've been growing. Um, we've made food with the stuff in the greenhouse and shared it with different teachers around the building and with some of our admin staff and our kids really take a, a sense of pride and ownership in all of these projects and um, it's, it's just getting them more contact with more of the population that, that's around them and I'm seeing kids growing and, and reaching out to some of their peers that they would have never even talked to before. Uh, I think uh, for middle school age kids is as we all can relate to is one of the harder times of your life probably and being a science teacher uh, science labs I feel are the best way to get some of these kids that have the trouble learning into with the gen ed kids and they can seamlessly kind of join them and, and do everything they're doing and it seems totally inclusive so as she was saying we do a lot of steam activities too uh, where they're doing builds uh, labs constantly where they can all just contribute and then you can uh, work those in with the the actual instruction and uh, some of the, the the beginning instruction I'm kind of going backwards now the beginning instruction before you even get to the labs uh, we talked about the picture mapping is that was, yeah. uh, with the pictures visual supports um, in integrating those into your actual instruction where you're putting them alongside maybe you do a, a, a PowerPoint or something that you just do commonly and you mix those in with the gen ed kids and they just see it up there too and you can kind of point as you're talking to different things and it, they can all relate them even though they're at a different level and uh, that helps a lot. In um, I'm Hannah Didalo from Greenfield Central um, as well I teach seventh grade geography. Um, I want to share like the story of how I got started with this and I, I love hate I love slash hate telling this story. Um, so I got hired just a few days before school started and um, I got thrown into it basically. And my, I don't like saying that because it sounds so negative, but um, Anna emailed me like the day before school started and she's like, hey, me and my kids will be up in your classroom. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, but I got started with it and I do a lot of the same things like he was just talking 
the visual supports. Um, something that I kind of figured out is like I'm trying so hard to come up with these visual supports that um, I think will be good for Anna's kids. That's what we call them, Anna's kids. <laughs> um, but like I come up with a picture that'll be good for them, and I'm like, you know what? Like this is gonna be this is gonna work for every kid. So that's kind of the the takeaway I've gotten from doing all this. Like I said, it's kind of thrown into it, <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> So you talk about how we got started, kind of like Coke, the opposite of Kokomo. So we have one special ed teacher. <laughs> so we thought, how in the world is she going to teach all the content areas to get all these kids their units for their certificate of completion? Well, she's not. And it doesn't make sense either because she doesn't understand or doesn't, isn't an expert, I should say, on, in biology. <laughs> didn't, that was wrong. I didn't, I'm sorry. I don't understand. I don't understand it either. No, so she's not the expert in biology. She's not the expert in world history, you know, those kind of things. So we did have to think about who are those uh, natural teachers that will do a great job um, collaborating with her and um, would be just excited about the opportunity. So we, did. we looked in our school to see who we thought and just approached and, and it's worked out real well. And then we had the great opportunity to attend the Focus on Inclusion Conference. And we took a team of six, well, five, including myself, and and we were just able to learn more ideas and skills and training for uh, supporting inclusion and brought an English teacher with us. So now, you know, it just kind of keeps rolling. So now next year, we're going to put some kids out in English learning, which is going to be amazing. So I'm really excited about that, too. Um, so it just kind of keeps, keeps snowballing out until everybody's really excited about it in your, in your school. Just to kind of piggyback on that, the fun part of being in Mr. Hutton's class was that I was actually a student, and then I was a student helper, and I did volleyball sets um, after games, and so it just kind of, and then I also worked with him as a resource um, teacher. I was in his class, and then so it's really kind of been fun to flow into that because I kind of know his teaching style um, as a student and a teacher, and it's just worked out really well. Oh, yes, brag about this part. The collaboration is really good, and I think when we see kids, we see we have very different viewpoints sometimes on how to address issues. We had a young man who really struggled with just the focus, the ability to focus for that time frame, and it was trying to find the ways, whether it's movement, whether it's removing distractions, whether it's something else. You know, I have a very different perspective, and she has a very different perspective, and I think um, the joy is that the relationship between us uh, in terms of understanding and, and trusting each other really allows us to be very open and, and uh, offer a lot of different viewpoints and respect each other's viewpoints. So that inclusion has been really interesting. And then some of the things that I would have <clears throat> probably viewed as more inclusive practices uh, I've used in my general ed classes and to, to great success. And it's been very interesting. And, and so one of the things I did just this last week was something I picked up at the folks on inclusion uh, uh, conference was I made a heart. There's a eight foot big heart on the floor, and my kids actually um, walk the heart. They do that. It has a labels flipped over, and they can practice on their own. And that's something that they talked about doing with different things. And so, if I were going to it again next year, when we do um, uh, when we do the light dependent cycle, we'll do that. We'll we'll walk the light dependent cycle, and we'll have those pieces. We'll try it anyway. I'm sorry. It's it seems like a great idea. We're going to try it, and we're going to see. It seems like a really useful tool to physically do it and i was surprised that you know these are obviously some of these other kids are my higher kids but they loved it and they all like i don't want to do it i want to do it and then they do it they run through five seconds and they're like all right we'll do it again you know and, and uh so it's it's kind of it's 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 been a tool that has maybe opened my eyes to some things that i i don't always feel like are the right fit but maybe they are or maybe they are more so than i think or maybe they're just maybe there's great scaffolds to build in to even help Gen Ed kids to be more successful, and it's I don't want to say it's an excuse, but now it's a reason to to have a more richer or richer or more fuller kind of experience, not only in my inclusion class, but in my other classes, too. So there's just a lot of really good things, whether we're like I said, we try things all the time. They don't always work and we just kind of go and we evaluate and then we try the next thing and we keep we keep going until we get the right mix of things that are going to be successful for students. Um, one thing that I did when I started um, 
I started at Manchester, uh, the students were all self-contained, ate lunch, did everything within one classroom. They left to go to the bathroom and that was about it. Um, and when I came, I, that's not what I came from um, when I changed schools and positions. And so I was like, what do you mean? They don't have lockers like every other kid? They don't go to the cafeteria like everybody else? Like, what? And uh, um, so like, we took little, little jumps. <laughs> we got lockers. Went to like art class and and things that were strengths for the kids first, so the kids could see it was successful, and then the adults saw that it was successful, and then the parents saw it was successful, and and we just kept rolling with it. And it took us a couple of years to build up stamina to get to the cafeteria because we walk across a parking lot, and halfway through a building to get to the cafeteria. And for some of our like, it's really technically not that far, but for students that hadn't left a classroom in multiple years, it was very far. It was like running a marathon, you know, and we had to work with the food services and the administration and they were all like, we'll do whatever you want. You know, like, this is totally awesome. We want them in the cafeteria. And I'm like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We have three lunch periods. We're going to come for all three. You're going to what? Eat for three periods? And I'm like, Yes, we are. <laughs> it's going to take us one period to walk there, one period to get our lunch and eat it, and one period to get back, and probably more than that to get back. <laughs> and so, you know, this year we've got it down to, I have some kids that have made it, they only have one lunch period. And they're so excited that they got, they ate, got their lunch, they ate their lunch, they got time to socialize with their friends and go play in the gym like everybody else does during lunch. and made it back to class on time with their peers without an adult telling them where they had to be. Um, and so that's just the, the little excitements and in inclusion that you wouldn't think would make a huge deal, but staff seeing and acknowledging that the students are there is the starting point. And then other students realizing that they're there and that it's okay and they can do the same things as them is okay too. Like I have one student that um, likes textures and things and we have pillars in our cafeteria and he's on a liquid diet and once he does drink he goes and talks to the pillar 25 minutes of lunch and everybody's like is he okay and i'm like he's fine he's having a great time he'll come over and talk to you when he's ready to come talk but for him he wants that that um stimulation from the pillar that he doesn't get in his other classes, it's all good. You get to do whatever you want during lunch. Why are you bothering him? <laughs> I don't question you when you go run around the gym. So, um, you know, like it's those little things that that our staff didn't think were a big deal that were the stepping stones to do academic inclusion. You know, like that really made a big difference. And I can just add on that is for the general educator, educator, it's so much easier to have the students in my classroom because I've seen them for a year at lunch. Um, I've seen them stop by my room to pick up the recycling. That's one thing they do. So it's just, I'm sure it's more comfortable for the student and it's more comfortable for me because we've gotten to know each other outside of the academic setting before they were inside the academic setting. They, they stare me down when I forget to put my recycling out. I'm, in general, I was really proud of how inclusive um, Kokomo High School was just in the hallways and athletics and things like that. We also participate in unified. Um, we have lots of gen ed peers. Um, we have the student council representative started a um, Cats Together lunch where our students, our gen ed students plan activities and eat lunch with our special ed students once a month so that they're not always just coming to our special ed classrooms for those interactions, but they're interacting with the students in what would be a general normal everyday time frame. Um, and then it's really cool because the students that are included in gen ed classes, um, Nikki just said that they're part of the STEM 
Academy. And so when they just modified, um, we've tried, we're beginning the certification process to become certified. And so some teachers do um, units on their own, and then we try once a semester to have, well, we do have like a themed unit. So when they just had a tiny houses themed unit, they had them in their special ed classes as well as their gen ed classes. So they could see they really are participating in activities just like they're saying, you know, their gen ed peers, because to them it's really not a lot different. And they had a blast doing it. So to see the students correlate with they are really a part of what's going on around the building was incredibly um, rewarding. All right, so thinking about, and, and this is always the million dollar question, time. So how do you find and um, allocate time for collaboration? And if, if there isn't one-to-one -one time, how do you get creative at five? time and, and ways to share curriculum, content, uh, this week's lesson plans, modification needs. Um, how, do you, how do you get creative and how do you find the time? So one thing that we've done at Manchester that has helped out as a whole, not just for our significantly um, impaired students is um, we've created binders for every staff member and we do an um, own IEP at a glance, not the one that comes from Indiana IEP, but we created our own. Um, it has almost the same information as the one that comes from Indiana IEP, but um, it's a little bit different to have a little more detailed information that our, our gen ed staff and our administrators and our guidance counselors all said, hey, this is important for us to know. And then we color code them by the teacher of record. And it's a lot, lot to manage at the beginning of semesters, but it's been phenomenal um, for the special ed staff. And would you say the gen ed pretty much? Yeah, okay. Um, to see the change, this is the second year that we've implemented it. And um, so we um, pass it out and we've already got it broken down by each um, class period. And we've sent, um, so at the beginning of the semester, we have it broken down by each class period. The accommodations, the disabilities, the teacher of record is listed. Um, any special notes that you need to have, um, accommodations, all of that stuff is listed in there. Health plan, all that good stuff. Anything you might need to know is listed there and it's divided by each period of the day for you. And then every time that we have an update, because, you know, we don't just do this once in a while. We send out envelopes every, you know, other day to everybody saying, hey, updated information. And then they send back the old info for uh, students to shred as one of their jobs. Um, but that's one way we've increased um, communication to make sure that everybody has the most up-to-date, relevant information. Um, we use a lot of online um, Google Forms. Um, to share in collaboration and get feedback for IEPs because that was something we continue to struggle with. Um, not everybody understanding the importance of that back and forth. Like, what, you can see power school, you can see their grades, can't you just tell how they're doing? Well, I, I don't know what your assignment, I see that it's listed as 3.2, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> I saw the assignment, but I can't remember what everybody's assignments are. So making sure they have the input that way. Um, and then we have um, two learning labs in our two different buildings, or two different buildings, but one building that makes sense with parking lot in between us. It's kind of confusing. Um, that we have staff running at, at all times to assist with um, accommodations and, and things as needed. Um, and then we have PLC time where special ed teachers can meet with gen ed teachers. Um, and then we meet in the hallways or wherever else needed. So I think Anna said earlier, we have uh, PLCs about once a, uh, once a month where we get to talk. <laughs> no, no, well, once a month um, that we can talk about stuff. But um, she mentioned, how do you be creative <laughs> with the time that you have? A lot of stuff that we do, we do on the fly just because we don't have that much time to plan. So, I mean, like, I'm giving out an assignment and it's basically the same. And I'm like, okay, what points are we, what points are we cutting down to on this one? And we do a lot of stuff on the fly.
during class. And if like we have work time during class, we also take that time to, all right, what's up for next week? <laughs> Not today. <laughs> So we also have PLC at Tippecanoe Valley. Um, we actually are able to meet once a month, once a week, sorry, um, on Thursdays and take that time to discuss with us and then also the biology teach other biology teacher. So we have that time and then we often use text or email if we need it and then also just kind of on the fly like they said. At Kokomo, the four transition teachers all have a common prep, so that's nice that if ever we need to meet daily, we could. Um, and also, um, all four of us transition teachers are also part of the STEM Academy, so that is a weekly meeting. And then our common prep could be daily. I mean, even if it's just for a two minute, pop down to our room to say, hey. Um, the, uh, the next question, we're going to switch to parents. Um, how have parents responded um, as you're, you're sharing this information at a case conference or you're getting parent phone calls? How are you and how are they seeing student growth, um, challenges, successes, um, takeaways? This is one of my super passionate points, actually. Um, and so it's still an incredible work in progress because I think um, we can never really communicate too well with parents. Um, we are getting attendance. Our teachers have done an amazing job communicating with the parents. Um, our goal was to get their team to the school so that that transition could be better. So by team, I mean their Medicaid case manager, um, anyone that's involved in looking at what their goals are post high school. Um, I used to sit in every meeting. The teachers now um, don't always need me there. I will if we need to allocate resources, um, but they could be PAR. So. Um, I'm getting lots of feedback from parents that will walk by and thank the teachers for everything they're doing. They're thanking the teachers for including the team. They feel like an active participant because it isn't just another meeting. We've made it a very intentional time. Um, and then when teachers are talking about and writing such incredibly meaningful goals and transition plans, and it's just when that kind of tone changes, like we're not rushing through it, but we're being very intentional. Um, the feedback from parents has been amazing, which really helps, I think, encourage the process for the teachers and administrators that the students absolutely are benefiting from the changes that are being made. Um, one of the things that kind of shocked me the first time was, uh, so I, our, my kids come in, our kids come in during a honors class, so it's mixed with all kids, not just a, a regular gen ed class. So, um, beginning of the year, you have parent teacher or parent teacher meetings. They, I see this guy come in, one of my kids' dads, and I talk to him all at once. And then later, he comes in, he walks in, he sits down right in front of me, and he says, "Okay, why is my son in here? Does he need this class? How is he? Because it's an honors class. He's like, are they? Is he going to get anything out of it? And at this point, I've already had him for a month, and I'm like, oh my goodness, it, it shocked me first because I didn't expect it. But it was, uh, I was like, yeah, your son is partnering up with these kids in the gen ed portion who aren't even with his daily friends in this and his class. Uh, the relationships that they're building with the other kids, amazing. And they're meeting like almost like lifelong best friends in some of these uh, instances. And this is something on top of the academic portion of it. And all these parents now are contacting in a second but just talking about how awesome it's been to get them into a gen ed class and, and build these relationships on top of the uh, academic portions we have, um, so many of my parents um, have been like very excited we had one boy that was in an ABA setting so he wasn't even in like gen ed at all I mean he wasn't in a school system so when he came to me, um, we started out, I think it was art maybe, and then the next year we started going to history class. And I just remember thinking, I have got to take like everything with me, like fidget. I mean, like I had a bag full of stuff, like we're gonna keep him in the class and entertained and this is gonna be great. And I assigned an assistant to sit right by him to make sure and like I was prepared. Hi, sorry. Um, I was prepared. Anyway, these are these assumptions that we make. 
he was, we were allowing the kids to walk in the hallway because they know where they're going. So we just let them walk in the hallway with the other kids and meet you there. Well, we would get in there and my assistant's chair would be across the room. Like every day we went in there and we found out the gen ed teacher was like, well, I don't know why, but he keeps moving it across there. So I pull him out and I ask him and he's like, I go, do you not want her to sit by you? No. Well, where do you want to sit, friends? And he points to the middle. And I'm like, you want to sit with your friends? He's like, yes. So I asked the gen ed teacher. So he made a little seat like there with his friends, like a quad with all the rest of it. Here I am assuming that he needs all this stuff. And he didn't. He didn't need any of it. He didn't want anything to do with us. So I think, um, and his mom says they go places all the time. And people stop and talk to their, their son. And I mean, like all of my parents say that. I just can't believe how many friends, like they have gen ed kids calling you know, my kids on the phone and we have best buddies and stuff. So we have lots of friends through there. But I mean, just he said lifelong friendships and it, and they eat lunch. Like I go to the cafeteria and eat and there's a few kids that are near me. But for the most part, my kids are out with the gen ed population and I check in on them. I mean, like they're just hanging out with their friends. So I think it's just different than what it was because it's, we're just a part of their, everybody knows them and it's just a part of their daily life. So that's, I don't know if anybody else. Okay. I think our parents have been surprised at what is going on in the classrooms. And um, you always hear that expression, a deer in headlights. Um, when they come to parent teacher conferences and um, when they bring the students with them, I say, well, let's tell mom or let's you know what we've been working on in math. And so when they start using some of these terms or they start pointing out or vocabulary wall or they start pointing out different things that we're doing and the parents mouths just like hang open and then um, when we start talking about all of the content connectors that we've worked on they're like my child is doing that you are teaching that to my child yes you know and um, we have students you know that as we all do that could not tell you numbers one two and three they couldn't count to three um, but they're learning to use a calculator and match those numbers. And so the parents are like, they're so excited and they're so um, happy that they get a calculator like everyone else. Or um, So it's just comments like that that have um, really been cool to see that coming from the parents too. So the, the question that I asked the first, the primary team, um, and I'm going to ask you too, and then we're going to ask our participants to do the same, is share an aha moment from the school year. Um, share something that stands out um, to you that impacted student learning, um, you know, stories like Anna shared about, about the student, something that connected that you can share, help benefit others. When we started the year, I was so worried about how the kids were going to be in the classroom, where they're going to feel like they were signaled out, where they're going to be a bad fit. Was it going to be, uh, you know, something where kids weren't going, to want, weren't going to want to part with them because they wouldn't feel like they'd carry their weight and do things. And so I kind of developed this, I had a, a dance card and kids went and picked partners before we started. And we kind of tried to, to address some of those things. So it wasn't something where they were in that moment. And it was the least thing that I found this year that I needed to worry about. It was something that I just focused on. And we talked about this a lot last summer as we're getting ready to go into this. You know, how do you, you know, what things do you do to make sure that this is a, an experience that's accessible for them? Uh, but, you know, you know, how do you, how do you modify it and not, let, not make them stand out, I guess. I mean, for lack of a better term, don't, don't single them out. Let them just be, you know, students with every other student. And uh, I was so worried about that, and it's been nothing. I, I've not had it happen. And it's been just an interesting thing because that was the thing I was really fixated on. So, it, you know, like you, I think you piggybacks on the stories you've said, kids are, kids are pretty good. They really are, as a general rule of thumb, even though there are going to be kids every now and then. And I say this story, and next year I'll have something, and it'll go sideways, and I'll be like, why didn't I do those things I was going to do last year? But that being said, I mean, you just have to adjust well, every year, and every year is different. It's just that's my biggest aha moment is that I need to focus more on the kind of curriculum, less about the structure and less about the inclusive, you know, worrying about the inclusion of, of, of special needs kids into gen ed classrooms and how to make that fit because that fit, our kids are nice and kind and generous and they're, they're going to make that fit happen irregardless of what I do for the most part, I guess, I hope is the, the best way to express that. 
I would say my aha moment was the um, just jump in even when you're unsure. Um, even if you don't know how it's going to work out in the end, um, jump in, have faith, and uh, jump in with both feet. Uh, not everybody is going to work out wonderfully. Not everything you try is going to work out wonderfully, but give it a true try because um, I had lots of support from my administrators and other teachers saying, sure, I'll not. Whatever you want to try, let's give it a try. And I'd be like, well, I don't really know what I'm doing, so you ask me all the questions you want, and we'll try. But um, almost every time, you know, there were things coming out of it that I didn't expect, and kids were bringing experiences out, and parents were sharing results that even I didn't see out of students. And sometimes it was a month, two months, three months later after the lessons before we started seeing some of those results from students. Um, I kind of feel like I have a bunch kind of all wrapped up in, into one. Um, so like I said, this is the first time I've ever worked with students like these kinds of disabilities. And I was nervous because only a second year teacher to begin with. Um, but I was kind of thinking like in my head, I'm going like, I'm terrified. Like, how am I not, how am I going to teach? Like, I don't, how am I going to teach them what they need to learn? And um, one of my one of my big moments is that we had a school board meeting um, where the classes showed off what they'd been learning uh, to the school board. And one of the one of our kids <laughs> he was telling them about the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And I'm like, and the, all the school board people are like, wow, so impressive. And I'm thinking, I'm like, really not that impressive. Like the Tigris and Euphrates, like, yeah, every other kid has to learn that too. But I'm I'm thinking like really like a like an, a life or death thing that they're going to learn and then I realize I'm like yeah well everybody every other kid learns that too and I'm like is it really a life or death kid for any other thing too so I'm like they're learning all this and even though it might not seem like the most necessary which like I'm a geography teacher I'll tell you that it's important until I I'll tell you it's important until I you know drop dead but um I'm like they they really are learning everything that every you know the other kids learn too Uh, my aha moment was definitely uh, one of the don't make assumptions category, I would say. Um, I have a child that is a pacer, and he kind of gets in the corner much like your pillar child. And uh, I would say I would be going through one of my many ways of instructions through the days of one of the units, and um, we'd go back, and finally we did a formal assessment. I, he had barely spoken to me very much other than just outbursts every once in a while uh, uh, throughout probably four months, three months or so. And then we go back to do a formal assessment and he sits down and Miss Anna asks him, okay, let's go ahead and let's uh, ask the question verbally. And then he sits down to type and he starts typing like full sentences. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, he can type that whole thing out like that. And then I look down and I was like, oh my God, that's perfect. That's exactly what I said. And he, and he just keep, continue to rip these off like perfectly. So. I know she's teaching as well in her class, but I he's getting what I had no idea he was listening to as he's in the other side of the corner in the room, just in his own little world. And I would even use that with telling other gen ed teachers that to have them in your room and administrators to get them in your room if they're not. So um, is that just blows me away every time I think about it. It's awesome. Um, I had a similar situation um, with a couple of my students. I have one very, very low functioning student. We're still working on identifying numbers and counting. And um, so we were working on variables in math. And so we read the story and we were like, okay, what's our first fact? And then um, I asked the question, I said, do we know how much Juan paid for that bowl of soup? And the whole class, you know, no, we don't. And I said, what are we supposed to do? And this little boy goes, you know, so he knew that that's what you should do if you don't know the answer. Um, so I thought that was really cool. And um, another story that I just found out about this week, um, we were um, talking about outliers. And um, so our student applied skills students run our school store. And so at the end, it was about time for the store to shut down. And so the um, teacher that was at the store that day said, okay, now we need to count our money and see how much money we made 
today. And so one of my students started putting her quarters in stacks of four so she would know how many dollars we'd made. And she said, oh, look, there's an outlier over here. There's one left over. So I thought, you know, um, she acts really cool in class. She has some family stuff going on. So she's always like out there wanting to learn and kind of sometimes has an attitude. And you're like, oh, she up on this. And then she transferred that to the school store, you know, and knew right away and told that adult, you know, well, we learned in math that that's an outlier, and this this one that's left over is an outlier. So that was very. Cool. I have um, two quick stories. Um, one is really about the relationship with parents. Um, we have a family with twins that are Down syndrome, and the mom is very protective, rightfully so. Um, they communicate only when they. So that's been a little challenging, um, but by building the relationships of trust and helping um, really raise that expectation, but kind of do it at her pace, where she could come along with us. They're participating in um, general activities. Um, they're doing more things in the community and they're really, they have friends that recognize them in the hallway that they have lunch with. So that's been um, some incredible growth there. And also, for one of our students that's just really off diploma track, um, you forget how much they really want to be like their gen ed peers. Um, and sometimes we, out of love and protection, that barrier. Um, and when we had some of our students got in gen ed classes, it was very interesting to um, watch her behavior. It wasn't always no matter what, she wanted to be like a teenager. And so the teachers had to work really hard behind the scenes just to remind her of appropriate and positive attention. But it was such a reminder that teenagers are teenagers. And sometimes we get in their way of discovery because we're trying to protect them. So that was pretty neat to kind of get her back on track, but it was a good reminder. All right. Well, um, I want to thank panel today. We're going to keep the chat box open and we'll keep our panel um, situated here. I'm going to um, go on ahead and talk a little bit about our summer opportunities. Um, thank you all for jumping in, A, to be on the panel, but B, to set um, ambitious goals this school year um, and, and really um, doing what's best for kids and, and working alongside the project success team to do that. So thank you. Um, what I'm going to do next is just show some upcoming opportunities um, and then show you uh, a couple of things that um, our model sites have done to set their goals, and I wanted to share kind of the templates that they so, uh, are to what the panel had discussed. We have an upcoming opportunity on a building inclusive building inclusive team. So um, this summer's regional training uh, sessions, six of them, same content at each location across the state, um, will focus on building inclusive teams. So as you were listening to the panel talk about their teams, talk about um, talk about their teams and talk about the goals that they set. Um, one really important thing is that you would be able to join and be a part of uh, the same process and join the project success team this summer, set goals, bring an inclusive team, bring your English language specialists, bring your SLP, bring your paraprofessionals and your administrators alongside yourself as a special educator to um, develop goals and think about what this looks like in the building. So, um, there's a link here. There's also a flyer on our website so that you can get all of that information um, to sign up and join. Uh, the next thing is each one of our model sites completed this goal template. So we made it available on the website um, underneath the model site summit today. We also put it up on the Padlet. Um, we complete this with our model sites every single year um, and we update it throughout the year where we talk about what is the vision for every single student. What are our long-term goals? What are our short-term goals? Um, and then how and who is responsible to help make that happen? Um, and this is a great way, um, as, as our discussions have talked about, that it takes an entire team. So this is a great way to include your entire team and to have ownership of each one of those goals um, and help each other get there. Um, as we are wrapping up, if you would please um, go on ahead and click on that aha moment link. Um, and share your aha moment. And then in the chat box, just share one of your next steps that you're going to take today. Um, so while you're filling out the aha moment, uh, we will just have the chat box going. Um, and we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to share what you're, what you're going to take away from a great conversation um, 
you're having conversation at your district level, what is the next step that you're gonna take? Um, and how will you share this information back to your team? We know that it takes a team. So this slide here, if you would take just a moment, I'm gonna go on ahead and um, just put up some upcoming opportunities so that you can glance at those. I'm gonna talk to those just in, here in a minute, but if you could just go on ahead and, and add something to the chat box and then um, fill out that aha moment as well. I'll just give a, a couple of minutes to do that. Um, and then I'm gonna talk to uh, what's happening next. So as you are filling that out, uh, we have a couple of at no cost resources and professional development opportunities for you. If you haven't already, please join our quarterly newsletter. Uh, we put out celebrations, we highlight uh, some of our teams and teachers, um, and we share best practice and resources that are available for that. Um, we have, as I've spoken to, the, the summer regional trainings and then our on-site professional development. There's a link to join that. As we have done in the past, uh, we're asking for uh, teams and school districts to sign up for three sessions as we know the impact of uh, professional development over time and practice um, implementation at the school level. And we also have each one of our on-site teams fill out a needs assessment so that we can target our instruction. We have a new opportunity coming up, which our model sites will be a part of and involved in, and that's our teacher leader cohort. And that is how we are going to help develop teachers into leaders um, as, as our model sites have. Um, we're gonna utilize and leverage our model sites as role models and uh, thought partners through this process. Um, there will be five on sites with the teacher leader cohort um, and two webinars in between, as well as an opportunity at the end to share knowledge and information that you've learned throughout the process with your local districts. So the teacher leader cohort, um, we're accepting 30 um, teachers and we'll have our model sites um, as available. Join us at those sessions as well. So check that out. If it's something that you're interested in, please sign up. And then the others are just our recorded webinars and our online courses for paraprofessionals. We have completely free um, courses for paras across the state of Indiana. We have six current courses, everything from um, standards and in instruction to uh, cultural competence to uh, assistive technology and accessible materials. All of this content is wonderful for your paras, completely free for them to take these courses. Also, as teachers, it's a great refresher um, and, and they're completely to you as well. So I just wanted to highlight those pieces of information as you're as you're adding to the chat box. And then, last but not least, please do not hesitate to reach out to our team. This is our contact information. Each one of our, our team members can answer your questions. Um, please reach out. Please contact us. We're going to keep the chat box open. Um, we're going to mute our microphone, but we will monitor that chat box. If you have questions, if there's things that we didn't get to today, please reach out to one of our team members and we'd be happy to answer that, or if you have a question for a model site and we weren't able to get to that question today, um, please email uh, one of the project success coaches and we'll reach out to that model site and get you connected. So thank you again for your flexibility um, during a tight notice of needing to change. Thank you to the panelists um, and our model sites for going above and beyond to help make this successful. Um, we appreciate you and have a wonderful day.